Welcome to News Inside. I'm An Jiang Hyun. Let's meet our panelists. Professor Shin Sang Yup from Kyung University Graduate School of International Studies is back with us. And Dr. Pong Young Shik from the ASEAN Institute for Policy Studies is with us as well. A spate of violence has rattled the world in recent weeks, inciting more fear about terror attacks and mass killings. What is the root cause behind these events? We'll take a look at some of the key issues. On the heels of the Nice terror attack in France, another random act of violence in Europe rattled the region. On July 22nd, a gunman opened fire in a Munich shopping mall in Germany, leaving nine people dead. Two days later, in Germany's southern city of Ansbach, a Syrian asylum seeker blew himself up near a festival, killing himself and injuring 12 others. With some of the recent attacks having been carried out by asylum seekers, there has been a growing sense of criticism against the country's refugee policy. Under Chancellor Angela Merkel, Germany has maintained an open-door immigration policy, allowing the entry of 1.1 million refugees last year and 220,000 in the first half of this year. Some have struggled with integration and carving out a new life within the country. In order to resolve these challenges, Germany recently adopted a number of sweeping reforms for refugee integration. But in light of these attacks, Merkel's open-door policy is likely to face more stumbling blocks down the line. So in Germany, there were four separate attacks in one week, but mm -hmm. these were not about religion or ideology. Mm -hmm. In fact, on this uh, very program, we've talked about the growing trend of random uh, acts of violence committed by uh, so-called lone wolves mm -hmm. or social mm -hmm. misfits, haven't we? Well, not only in Germany, but also in many countries around the world, uh, such as Japan and Turkey, well, there have been a series of the terrorist I mean, attacks. Uh, but the uh, one thing uh, which is common among these cases is uh, those are attacks committed by the people who do not have special religious or political reasons. For example, uh, several days ago, a teenage African refugees hacked at passengers on a train with an axe and knife. And the, uh, also a few days ago, a 27-year-old, the Syrian, whose refugee applications had been refused, blew himself outside a bar in a, a city in Germany. So all of them committed this kind of criminal I mean, attack without special reasons. So mm -hmm. this is different from the previous uh, attack committed by the terrorists. Mm. Yes, in Germany's uh, case, three of the assailants were refugees or asylum seekers, while one was an immigrant. How do you think their individual backgrounds may or may not tie in with these attacks? I'm afraid there is a growing tendency to build correlation between their identity as a refugee uh, members and their, their act of violence, but uh, that should be avoided because when you make the uh, false correlation uh, for these uh, examples of terrorism, then you may end up with making a false uh, and a very costly foreign policy, which goes against your purpose of having uh, you know, social integration. So the a cure for this very difficult challenge to these societies is not uh, moving away from the principle of social harmony and compassion, but rather moving closer to embracing those values, mm. Mm. which is very difficult in a very uh, fragile <coughs> and volatile political atmosphere in any vibrant democracy. There will be p political propagandas and demagogues uh, to take most advantage of these unfortunate incidents, but this is time that the uh, uh, health of democracy will be truly tested. Mm. Mm. Well, we're seeing some common denominators in these attacks. Mm. Uh, first of all, they're uh, taking place in busy public places during some peak hours. And another uh, common denominator might be that uh, it's out of anger and frustration mm. uh, that these perpetrators committed these crimes. Well, uh, in uh, most cases, uh, those uh, lone wolves uh, wanted to draw attention from the people. And they the, uh, choose the uh, soft targets, or so called. That means that they want to kill many people. And then uh, on weekend, uh, well, we can see uh, 
uh, many people go outside home and they wanted to have the, their own, I mean, enjoy their life. So maybe uh, a weekend could be the uh, best timing, I mean, time for the uh, lone wolves to uh, commit the uh, attack. And secondly, uh, the places where they commit the attacks were like the uh, open places. Well, these two things may be the main reason why they committed their attack in the places like the uh, small town, I mean, in Germany or even in the uh, care center in Japan or in some the markets in Turkey. Mm -hmm. or those that, kind of that randomness and yes. that murkiness of the place, the, uh, the assailant and the timing, that's the uh, biggest challenge for the government mm -hmm. whose main mission is to protect the safety of its citizens. Right, right. It's so you, mm. right, if you look <clears throat> at the other time, place, and the other uh, uh, assailants, then, and the in, even instruments, there is no easy guessing game available mm -hmm. to the government. Places include Orlando, nightclub, mm -hmm. Nice, when innocent citizens mm -hmm. came out on weekend, peaceful weekend, to enjoy the firework mm -hmm. on Bastille. So you cannot really guess how mm -hmm. to protect yourself, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. the government is extremely difficult to protect your citizen because the assailants are not acting as a representative of the terrorist organization or institution, but as random individuals. Mm. So in some cases, they claim that they're acting on behalf of right. greater terrorists. But it groups. was not really the well orchestrated right. and premeditated act of a, a terrorist attack in close coordination with the, uh, the headquarters of the terrorist groups. So the individual acts are extremely hard for the government to and the security services to locate and prevent. Well, terrorist organization can uh, use these people, but these people can also use the terrorist organization as their excuse mm -hmm. for committing these crimes. That's why... Yeah, excuse and the source of the motivation mm -hmm. or the mm -hmm. getting the mandate. Mm -hmm. I mean, the common element in all this uh, seemingly random act of terrorism by individuals is one thing. There is hatred to mm -hmm. the world, mm -hmm. absolute hatred. The uh, young Japanese guy who killed uh, 19 innocent uh, seniors mm -hmm. housed in the care home those are with the disabilities, uh, reportedly uh, shouted that it's better that disabled people disappear. Mm. As if he were given mandate from the higher authority to cleanse the world mm. in the mm. name of fairness and justice. Mm. And this is a frustrated young guy who just got fired from work. Mm. So hatred and frustration are at the bottom of all these individual mm. terrorists. Mm -hmm. mm. But one thing which I really concern is that uh, maybe the uh, number of immigrants um, entering into uh, the European countries uh, would, I mean, uh, continue to increase. And the uh, global economy, including European economy, has been in a bad shape over the last years. And the, uh, because of the increased number of Im immigrants, the uh, people would, would think that they, they can lose their job, then they will complain about the happening at their society, then they want to express the, the anger in various ways. Attack against the non, the, uh, I mean, the ordinary people can be one of the way of the expression of their anger. And another side of the coin is that the, those among the immigrants, uh, many of them will have the difficulties in settling down in the society. They also want to express their anger against the society. Mm. So I think this can be one of the really worrying points uh, I mean, we have to concern about. Right. I mean, it's not just, uh, uh, you know, people with an immigrant, immig immigrant background getting angry about the society and not welcoming them, mm. but it's also vice versa. Mm -hmm. It's right, a right. cyclical uh, mm. downward spiral, which makes everybody radicalized and angry. Mm. Mm. And uh, thanks to the, uh, the spread of uh, social, uh, you know, SNS, the information about the uh, extreme ideas are extremely pervasive. Mm -hmm. Just like the Malcolm Gladwell's book, The, the Tipping Point, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a, a syndrome of uh, epidemic. It's a copycat syndrome that uh, some you know, people with an extreme sense of frustration and alienation mm -hmm. uh, get attracted to extreme ideas, mm -hmm. you know, falling into the uh, trap of you know, extremism. Right. Mm -hmm. In Korea as well, we've seen a growing number of uh, crimes, some of them brutal crimes, mm -hmm. committed by mentally troubled people or illegal immigrants. As you said, we don't want this leading to a bigger um, uh, social uh, fear, fear uh, yeah. like xenophobia or social outcasting of specific groups of people. So how should we deal with this? Well, if I, first of all, I want to uh, talk about the uh, situation we have. I mean, we have about 2 million 
immigrants. Mm -hmm. But out of two million, about the 10% illegal immigrants we have as of the end of 2015. But the problem we have is that the government uh, never ever, ever conducted a very uh, well organized the survey about the, uh, the num even number of the uh, immigrants and how they uh, enter into Korea and then in which reason they uh, the, uh, live in Korea. We don't have those kind of data. Uh, only several NGOs have conducted their surveys. So I think uh, we're living in the year of globalization. We have to live with the uh, foreigners who want to come to Korea. So if this is the reality facing us, then we have to uh, the, uh, arrange I and mean, make some very well prepared the, uh, system, including uh, the uh, pilot test or survey to get the very accurate information about the situations um, and the Im number of immigrants and then how they enter into Korea and then the, popul the immigrant population distribution in Korea. All those kind of things can be the, uh, uh, the basic information for us to make the uh, very good policies dealing with the, uh, the foreign I mean, immigrants. Mm. We have to remember the case of the, uh, the Chosung incident in the mm. Virginia Tank Massacre right. which killed the uh, 33 innocent lives and uh, at, the, at that time Koreans in Korea and the Korean Americans in the United States were extremely afraid of possible backlash mm. and the revenges uh, by Americans because they believe that this is an ethnic, you know, ethnic issue that Korean, a Korean guy killing innocent American, you know, uh, citizens. But that was not the way that the American population mm. perceived the whole situation. Mm. What if uh, the American population perceived the incident? Uh, in terms of racial profiling, that Koreans are like that. Mm. Koreans can, should not be uh, uh, admitted to our country because they are so danger, dangerous. So uh, we have to be objective in assessing the pros and cons and the uh, root causes of these uh, hate crimes uh, uh, you know, conducted by the individual terrorist mm. uh, away from uh, you know, um, you know, false uh, you know, perception in terms of racial profiling. In Germany right now, though, um, Chancellor Angela Merkel is under pressure to review her open-door refugee policy. Do you see this creating a fundamental change within Germany, and how might it impact uh, other countries' policies? It will be a, a very important and, um, you know, um, difficult uh, challenge for the Merkel government, but I do not think that there will be any overhaul of the, you know, uh, existing policy to accept immigrants uh, because as the uh, Home Minister uh, well put that uh, German democracy is not very fragile uh, vulnerable democracy that it used to be uh, before the outbreak of the Second World War but it's a stable and mature <clears throat> democracy so I think the German government will stay the course and uh, uh, the bill passed uh, in the lower chamber of the German parliament actually emphasized the benefits provided the governments to uh, help the newcomers to uh, improve their uh, uh, language skill and uh, their uh, you know, chance to get a job. The, based, uh, the, the best uh, uh, antidote uh, for terrorism, especially for young uh, population who fail to uh, settle in the new environment, are two things. One, democracy, so that they can raise their voice uh, in, in the name of diversity. Two, jobs. Mm. If they have a you know, uh, jobs, then they'll remain hopeful and positive, and uh, they refuse to, uh, you know, try, you know, uh, you know, subvert the status quo. And out of total German population, the uh, foreign immigrants uh, took about 8.7 percent as of the end of 2015. So I think the uh, German government cannot change their. Uh, policy, immigration policy, uh, very dramatically because that when if they do that, that there will be I mean, 8.7 uh, percent uh, the uh, population will be another problem. So the Germany will be very extremely careful in changing their uh, the uh, the immigration policy. Mm -hmm. I think one, one possible subject of the heated political debate in the parliament is whether to change the law to allow use of uh, uh, military means mm -hmm. for internal security. Because of the uh, dark shadow of the Second World War and Nazism, the German constitution prohibits use of the military forces for internal security situation. Mm -hmm. Only national police will 
you know, uh, take care of the internal, you know, uh, terrorist attack. Mm -hmm. But given the seriousness of our current terrorist challenges, then there might be some political voice in favor of changing uh, the constitutional arrangements. Let's move on to uh, geopolitical news here in Asia. The ASEAN Regional Forum, or ARF, came to a close earlier this week in Vientiane, Laos. The security forum came at a time when the Association of Southeast Asian Nations is facing prickly relations, both in and outside of the regional bloc. Here are some of the highlights. Top diplomats from countries in the Asia-Pacific came together in Laos for an annual round of multilateral diplomacy in the region. Seoul's Foreign Minister Yun byung se was also there to attend a number of key gatherings. This year, issues such as North Korea's nuclear ambitions and the South China Sea led to heated debate and a flurry of diplomatic activities. With all members of the halted six-party talks in attendance, it was also an important venue to make progress on Pyongyang's denuclearization. Foreign Minister Yun first held one-on-one -on -one talks with his Chinese counterpart Wang Yi to exchange views on North Korea's nuclear program and Seoul's decision to deploy the U.S. missile defense system, THAAD, a key issue Beijing had opposed. South Korea's recent behavior has inflicted harm on the long-standing basis of mutual trust. The closer bilateral ties get, there can be many challenges. Because of the deep foundation we have built, I don't think the challenges cannot be overcome. The following day, Minister Yoon also met with his Japanese counterpart Fumio Kishida to discuss follow-up measures on a Seoul-Tokyo agreement regarding Japan's wartime sexual slavery as well as Pyongyang's nuclear program. In talks with U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry, the two sides placed much emphasis on greater solidarity between Seoul and Washington. Also in the spotlight was a one-hour meeting between the top diplomats from North Korea and China. Pyongyang's Li Yongho and Beijing's Wang Yi are said to have discussed ways to bolster bilateral ties. So there was a flurry of diplomatic activities at Asia's largest annual security meeting. What were some of the top items on the agenda this year? Probably the most uh, significant uh, top item on the table for ARF uh, th this year is the South China Sea situation. I think the key word for Chinese government is to damage control. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, after, in the aftermath of the uh, permanent court of arbitration's ruling that uh, China's claim of the, its resources in the South China Sea based upon its uh, 1947 so-called nine-dash line has no legal bearings. And the Chinese government uh, uh, declared that uh, the country will uh, not accept the ruling at all cost. But at the same time, it is extremely necessary for the Chinese government to uh, try to embrace the ASEAN countries so that uh, the uh, PAC ruling will not have any further bearings on the future uh, tie between China and the ASEAN countries, mm. especially with regard to the issues uh, at, in the South China Sea. Yeah, and it sounds like uh, China has won that uh, diplomatic battle this time around because the ASEAN nations uh, decided to not mention any specifics in their joint statement regarding the South China Sea dispute. Right, definitely. The uh, rather muted uh, response by the ASEAN as a whole is due to the uh, distinct feature of the uh, ASEAN as an international institution, uh, which is process-based and a consensus-based uh, organization. Uh, China is uh, uh, basically proposing two things to the ASEAN country. One is that, remember that we agreed uh, by signing in 2002 the Code of Conduct, mm. which stipulates that any differences between us with regard to the uh, the uh, um, you know, maritime issues, uh, the delimitation, resource development, or freedom of navigation in South China Sea should be uh, dealt uh, uh, between ourselves. So no outside intervention, i.e. no United States. <laughs> and second uh, point is the dangling the carrot in front of ASEAN country. We are trade partners. For the past six years, we have become the biggest trading partners. You want to continue the source of prosperity. And uh, we just launched the other uh, One Belt, One Road, uh, the Maritime Silk Road plan, and you will be the uh, biggest beneficiaries if the plan goes well. Mm. So do not let this uh, ruling uh, distraction from 
all these uh, potential benefits. Mm. But I think there was another hadith during the forum that was deployment of the Thad and the Korean Peninsula, mm -hmm. where there are big discussion between Korea and Chinese government, uh, Chinese uh, foreign minister. And also there was uh, all some, some hot debating between the American uh, the I mean the uh, foreign minister and Chinese foreign minister. So I think uh, this was another the uh, hard issue uh, uh, discussed by the uh, the ministers of the major concern related countries. Yes, and we heard some strong words from Beijing on Seoul's decision <laughs> to deploy um, THAAD, but Korea's foreign minister Yun byung se countered with a few old Chinese proverbs, mm -hmm. one of them being, if you want to get rid of weeds, you have to pull out the roots. What do you make of this <laughs> Well, the uh, minister Yun made it clear that the, uh, the, what, is the, what, what the problem is uh, regarding the THAAD deployment of the Korean Peninsula he said that the reality facing the South Korea is the uh, direct threat posed by the North Korean nuclear missiles. This is the fact. This is the matter of life and death for us. And the, uh, this is not related to the uh, security or defense uh, I mean, of China. And well, but anyway, uh, and we have also the high expectation on China to play some mediating role to solve the uh, North, North Korean nuclear missile, I mean, the uh, crisis. But a lack of expectation, uh, the uh, Chinese government has not been very successful in persuading North Korea to change their uh, the policy. So I think the uh, Minister Yun made it clear that if you do not want deployment of the Thad and Korean Peninsula, you have to change in North Korea. I think that was his message. Well, China's Wang Yi did meet with uh, North Korean Foreign Minister Ri Yong-ho for the first time in almost two years. What mm -hmm. do you think they talked about? It's an expression of frustration and anger at South Korea accepting the U.S. proposal of deploying that despite a vehement and the persistent opposition uh, by Beijing. Uh, I don't know how long this cordial and friendly uh, atmosphere between Beijing and Pyongyang will last because North Korea poses uh, to uh, Beijing uh, as both a liability and strategic mm -hmm. asset. Um, for now, North Korea's value as a strategic uh, uh, wish vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis South Korea is more useful for China, uh, but um, we have to wait and see how these dynamics will uh, continue. Well, the, t the two foreign ministers uh, didn't meet one-on-one -on -one at last year's meeting, so right. what changed between then and now is THAAD. Person. Right, right. Uh, last year, uh, it was an uh, expression of the anger by Xi Jinping government that North Korea went ahead with a nuclear missile mm -hmm. test despite clear warning uh, and opposition by Beijing. But this time, it is South Korea that uh, you know, defy the, uh, the uh, persistent warning and opposition by Beijing with regard to the deployment of that. Mm. So China is doing the balancing act between the two Koreas. Mm. Well, there was also a push by participating countries to further isolate uh, North Korea by specifically mentioning the North Korean nuclear issue in the chair's statement. Mm. Uh, but China and Laos were against it. Tell us about that. Yes, they did. Well, in fact, the uh, uh, Laos is the uh, one of the strongest allies among the Southeast Asian countries. So uh, they did not want to uh, join to uh, the other Asian member countries to push North Korea on a strong isolation. And then the China, as we discussed so far, they have uh, shown different stance about two issues, right? On deployment of Thad on the Korean Peninsula and the South Sea China issue. So definitely uh, we can see the uh, groupings of the countries depending on the issues. Korea, Japan and USA are standing on the one side and the, uh, the China and North Korea and Laos standing on the other side. So I think the, uh, well, it's quite the uh, expectable to see objection of the uh, Chinese government and the Laos government about the uh, uh, efforts to putting these the two things on the chair uh, statement. Mm. Meanwhile, over in the U.S., the presidential race is in full swing after the Democratic National Convention in Philadelphia this week and Donald Trump's official nomination as a Republican candidate last week. Donald Trump was officially named the Republican presidential nominee last week during the party's national convention that took place in Cleveland, Ohio. One of the central themes of his speech was Americanism. Americanism, not globalism. 
will be our credo. The Democratic National Convention kicked off in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania this week, where Hillary Clinton was officially nominated. A large number of star speakers, including President Barack Obama and First Lady Michelle Obama, were there to support Clinton, who made history by becoming the first female presidential nominee in U.S. history. And I can't believe we just put the biggest crack in that glass ceiling yet. Through the national conventions, policy platforms for each party also came to light. In terms of the Korea-U.S. alliance, the Democratic Party said it would advance ties, while the Republican Party described the relationship as being close in the fields of the economy, military, and culture. They both strongly criticized North Korea and its current practices. In the areas of trade, the Democrats said workers and the environment would be the priority, while the Republicans raised the need to revise existing trade deals with other countries. With now less than four months to go, the two candidates will head into a fierce battle in the polls in their bid for the top office in America. These national conventions not only attract massive attention nationwide, they're also uh, said to be a great win for the cities hosting them. Mm. This time around, they were Cleveland and Philadelphia. What's all the excitement about? Well, according to the report uh, released by major American journals, well, the uh, average number of the participants in the uh, party conventions are about 15,000. Uh, besides the, uh, the ordinary people who have interest in politics, they get it together in the place where the party conventions are held. So about 50,000 people participated in the uh, political party conventions. Well, roughly uh, the about one person spent about $1,000. So maybe uh, if any city uh, hosts a uh, party convention, political party convention, they could get the gain, the uh, economic effects equivalent to about $15 million. But I think this is not everything. I mean, by hosting the uh, such a kind of the uh, convention in a city, they could draw the attention from the people and then they can use this opportunity to uh, uh, revitalize their depressed economy. Cleveland was the uh, city which suffered from a great depression over the last years and then they just tried to the overcoming the economic difficulties by hosting this uh, convention. So, but they can build the uh, image of the uh, Cleveland as the uh, place which has the dynamism and the potentiality to be developed more than before. Mm. Yeah, you mentioned Cleveland as a city regaining dynamism, mm. but uh, one, uh, an, another blessing for the city uh, is that it won the NBA championship. <laughs> <laughs> yes. well, well, one of the headline grabbers at the Republican convention was, of course, Melania Trump's speech, as well as the performance of other Trump family members. Um, do you think any of this will add to or detract from Donald Trump's uh, popularity? Well, I think Donald Trump's popularity will stay its course. Uh, uh, you correctly point out that the Republican Party convention looked like a family affair, mm -hmm. right? Uh, usually only one family member, uh, potential first lady, would speak at the convention. But this time, uh, Mr. Donald Trump's daughter, Ivanka Trump, uh, spoke and uh, received a very positive review. But the fact that uh, Donald Trump was heavily relied upon its own family member is indicative of lack of unity and support within the Republican Party. Donald Trump himself is an outsider from the onset, but his uh, style uh, of a campaign has alienated uh, many members of the Republican Party. So a good example is the, you know, uh, his rival, uh, Ted Cruz, mm -hmm. only congratulated uh, Donald Trump for winning the nomination, but mm -hmm. never officially outright endorsed him. Right. And uh, he said even that uh, urging party members vote for your conscience. <laughs> vote for your conscience, mm -hmm. not vote for the you know, party in you know, a candidate. Mm. If you love our country and love your children as much as I know that you do, stand and speak and vote your conscience. Vote for candidates up and down the ticket who you trust to defend our freedom. And then uh, he got a boot out of the stage, but. That's a, a clear indication of a deep chasm 
uh, within the party. Yeah. So the Republican convention uh, had a rocky start, mm -hmm. as uh, Dr. Bull mentioned. There were um, anti-Trump protesters rallying outside the venue. Key party members were absent from the convention. There was that snub from Ted Cruz and signs of a fracture within the party. Despite all of that, uh, Trump managed to secure an easy nomination. Mm. What do you think this outcome reflects? I think we have to think about who are supporting for Mr. Trump. Uh, as you know very well, the uh, underprivileged class, uh, the white people, less educated white people, strongly support for the uh, Mr. Trump. The global economy has been in bad shape over the last 10 years. USA was not an exception, even though USA economy has shown very slow recovery. But still, we cannot say the USA economy is out of the uh, crisis. So in the middle of the uh, economic crisis, they, who will be the victims of the uh, crisis? They must be the underprivileged class people, grassroots people. Then the, uh, so the, uh, Mr. Trump empathized that uh, we have lived in a globalized world. So in the past, the USA should do something to solve the, uh, the common problems facing all humanities. For example, European Union has facing uh, serious difficulties even in the middle of the economic crisis. Brexit happened, so the EU European countries have faced serious difficulties. Then the question is, then USA can do something to solve the economic difficulties facing the European countries? His answer is no. We don't have to do that and we cannot afford to help them. So we have to put, put the first priority on ourselves. And this logic, his argument was welcomed by the underprivileged class people. Well, the Republican Party convention had a very rocky start, but the Democratic Party convention was not really exception to it either. You had a very rowdy crowd mm. uh, chanting Bernie, right. Bernie, right? Mm. Expressing a deep-seated distrust uh, for the establishment. The anti-establishment emotion was very palpable. That is why candidate Hillary Clinton lined up so-called star speakers mm -hmm. in the early stage of the convention uh, tried to put up uh, the fire before it gets out of control, mm. including uh, First Lady Michelle Obama, Cory Booker, the senator, uh, rising star, the senator of New Jersey, and Elizabeth Warren, uh, the senator of the Massachusetts. Mm. Yes, mm. and Hillary Clinton has now become the first female presidential nominee in right. U.S. history, and that's no small achievement. Right, the entire U.S. history that uh, goes back to 228 years. There has not been even a, a candidate uh, representing the major political party uh, as a vice presidential candidate. So this is a clear uh, example of uh, women in the United States uh, breaking the uh, glass ceiling. but. Well, this is a very interesting presidential election. Uh, this must be the, the first time in the U.S. presidential election history that both candidates are extremely unpopular. Mm. Mm. Uh, and this is a, a, a big problem for not only for uh, Mr. Donald Trump, but for Senator Clinton as well. So according to the, uh, the New York Times article citing the recent CNN and CBS polls, 6-8% of the U.S. constituents say Clinton is not honest and trustworthy. And this number is very close to the number for the Mr. Donald Trump. 43% 43 of American voters said that Mr. Donald Trump is not honest and trustworthy. That is uh, rather understandable uh, considering the very uh, rough and uh, controversial remarks and uh, behavior of the Republican Party candidate. But Senator Hillary Clinton has been extremely careful and uh, subdued, uh, tried to avoid all these uh, criticism. But still, 68% does not give her credit as an honest politician. And uh, only 31% of the Americans have a favorable view of uh, Senator Clinton. 56% has an unfavorable favorable view of the Senator Clinton. And this number is worse than the number for uh, Mr. Donald Trump because uh, Trump has never been under 31 percent. At least 31 percent of American uh, you know, voters uh, say that uh, they have a favorable view of Donald Trump. So all these controversies or, or dramas on the media, Donald Trump is more favored mm. than 
uh, Senator Clinton. Well, they're both unpopular. So both are unpopular. <laughs> the question is, uh, <laughs> they're, they're going to vote for the lesser of the two evils. <laughs> right, perhaps, uh -huh. right. Uh, well, the key interest for people in most other countries is not only who wins, mm. but uh, how that will um, reshape American policies. Now, many are projecting that uh, regardless of who wins, um, we are likely to see a resurgence of protectionism. Would you agree? Yes, I do. When Mrs. Clinton embarks on presidential candidate, her stance was different from what she is. Actually, she was, uh, I mean, for the fair and open trade. Right. Uh, but the, in the middle of the campaign, she, cha she was changed. Right now, she insists that Korea and the uh, uh, USAFTA should be renegotiated because uh, the USA has lost many things because of the FTA. So which means that regardless of who will win the election, I mean, at the presidential election, I think we will face the strong protectionism in the trade with the USA. So I think we have to make every effort to use the existing system, such as the dispute settlement system uh, in WTO. And WTO has been uh, free from the uh, pressure uh, given by the United States or other big companies in the last uh, several years. But the one, one thing which I really concern about is that Mr. Trump said that if he become the president of the United States, he will very seriously consider withdrawal of the membership of WTO. So I think the, we still many things to overcome, but I think uh, at the moment what he can do is that we have to do our best to keep our the, uh, the benefits. Mm. What about security policies? I mean, if Clinton wins, we can probably expect no major changes, but a uh, Trump victory could totally shake up uh, American policies toward Asia and Korea. If uh, uh, you know, Mr. Trump uh, wins the election, then she, he will uh, try everything to uh, be the tough negotiator. That has been his uh, you know, currency in his whole career using the same hand gestures, right? Mm. Uh, we're going to make it huge for American <laughs> people, right? To make America great again. So I don't know whether all this uh, extreme uh, rhetoric about pulling U.S. security commitment uh, from the allies, unless the allies will assume their own responsibilities. It is a first uh, uh, negotiation gambit, not serious uh, policy uh, uh, consideration. We have to wait and see until he actually enters the White House. But one difference between the previous cases of the uh, U.S. Uh, leader uh, committing himself uh, to uh, reduction of U.S. forces overseas, such as uh, President Jimmy Carter, who withdrew his plan to significantly reduce the U.S. forces in South Korea because of the input uh, from his cabinet members. Uh, in the security affairs. I don't think that kind of restraining conditions uh, will be available to the presidency of Mr. Donald Trump. So it will be uh, far more uncertain and rocky. Mm. Well, after the national conventions, uh, the latest poll by CNN ORC puts Trump ahead of um, Clinton, but the two are still very much expected to be in a neck and neck race. What do you think are some factors that could swing uh, voters one way or the other come election day? Well, currently the issue hit the American society is black and white conflicts. So I think the uh, how to deal with the, the uh, racial issues, I think it will be the uh, uh, determining factor at the presidential election. So I think uh, anyone, any candidates who suggested the, uh, the best solution to this issue, I think he will gain more support. Dr. Bong? Well, as I said, that uh, this is an election in which both candidates are extremely unpopular. <laughs> so uh, making yourself more likable is a key to success. Well, we have to wrap up. Any last words before we go? Well, I wish the Americans uh, make a wise choice <laughs> to come in the election because that the presidency in the United States of the United States is very, very important. Not only the American uh, of America, but also the global community. Mm -hmm. So I wish the Americans make a wise choice at the uh, coming presidential election. But the big question now is which one is the wise choice, <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Fong? As in, as is uh, uh, personal matters, uh, so is a uh, matter of a country's character. The true character of a country is tested by adversities. And this is a high time for European countries to, uh, you know, uh, look back. 
uh, its own their own national history and see uh, what brought them uh, to this day as a mature democracy, embracing the value of diversity and tolerance. Mm. Well, thank you two very much for sharing your thoughts with us today. Thank you. That is all for this edition of News Inside. Thanks for watching. We'll be back with more next week.